Uh, hello folks, it is uh, LB here and today we are going to be uh, poning Startup. Uh, Startup is a box on TryHackMe that I made. Uh, it's a very easy box. It's meant to uh, test your enumeration skills. Not too hard in terms of, you know, testing enumeration, but just very basic stuff. Uh, encouraging you to put those, uh, those skills that every beginner should have learned uh, to use in a practical environment. And at least that was the aim. I hope that's what happened uh, when you guys did it. If you're watching this right up before doing the box, I highly discourage it. Please try the box out for yourself first. Even if you get stuck, don't look at write-ups just yet. Uh, I promise you'll get there. It just takes time. Again, this is a very easy machine. So if you are stuck, uh, you will eventually get the answer. You can ask for a hint on the Try Hack Me Discord or whatever. And when you find out what you were supposed to do on your own, it's going to feel so much better than when you watch this write up and say, oh, that's how it should have been done. I could have figured it out myself. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to deploy the machine. And I'm also going to carefully scroll down on this task because I don't want to reveal the flags. Uh, we are Spice Hut, a new startup company that just made it big. We offer a variety of spices and club sandwiches in case you get hungry. Uh, but that is not why you are here. To be truthful, we aren't sure our developers know what they are doing and our security concerns are rising. We ask that you perform a thorough penetration test and try to own root. Good luck. So that's just setting the story right there, setting the tone. I have a list of what we need to do for task one in here. We need uh, the secret spice recipe to this, or we need the secret spice recipe to the soup. Uh, we need user and we need root. So yeah, we'll just get this started right away. I'm gonna get my my, uh, my command ready so I can just press enter when the machine boots. I'm gonna be using a rest scan by uh, B, who's actually a developer at TryHackMe, I do believe, correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, but yeah, they made this very fast port scanner in Rust. It scans all the ports, multi-threaded, very cool, a very fast, good for time limited stuff like first bloods or uh, battlegrounds or king of the hill stuff whatever so i'm just going to pop the ip right in here and we'll get started now, the reason it asked me for my password is this is actually an alias i made and put in my bash rc because uh, rustscan runs off a docker instance or a docker image um this argument right here, these two dashes are going to specify the flags you want to pipe into Nmap. So how Rustscan works is it finds all open ports, and then it only pipes those open ports into Nmap. So it's not like a full port scan. It just pipes the ports that were found open into Nmap, and it passes these flags to Nmap. And then I'm just outputting it into scan. So let's see what we got. Uh, we got uh, three ports open. We got 22, which is probably SSH, 21, probably FTP, and port 80, which is probably HTTP. Uh, we see here that uh, FTP has anonymous access allowed uh, as seen in the scripts as the result. Uh, we see SSH and we see port 80, which is running Apache. Uh, this seems like it's the easiest to access currently or I mean, I guess HTTP, but I'm just gonna do this because I feel like uh, personally, anytime I see anonymous FTP, I just do that first. So I think I already had on my clipboard, but whatever. We're gonna FTP in, and since we know that anonymous access is allowed, we'll log in with anonymous, and anything is the password, and then we'll LS. And we see some stuff. We see an FTP directory, uh, nothing's in it. Um, we see two other things here. Let's check for any hidden files. Uh, nothing besides test.log. We know that's nothing because it's zero bytes, so there's nothing in it. Um, or is there? This might be it. Never mind. I don't know. I'm just telling you this doesn't, doesn't matter straight up. Uh, let's just get important.jpg and notice.txt. That has like five bytes in it, so it doesn't really matter. Oh, that's not how you do it, is it? I don't know why I, that's not, okay, you gotta do that separately. I'm having a little brain fart. So I got important, I believe. No, I got notice, because that was the last argument. So I'm gonna get important.jpg, and then we're just gonna do our dirty work on it. That one's a bit bigger. 
Um, we can try opening up imports in J JPEG, and we'll see. Um, it's a meme of uh, Among Us that that game that personally I don't even play, so I'm not sure why I chose it. I think I just want to be trendy. Um, but this image doesn't matter. The notice.txt, it also really doesn't matter to any other situation. Of course, you want to re-notice.txt. Oh, what the heck? Did I cat the wrong thing? Oh, hold on. I know what the problem is. I'm not going to cut this part out because uh, it's good to encounter troubles. I think I have my, yeah, I'm using binary mode to transfer files. So if I type ASCII, okay. So I'm transferring files with a binary mode because I was doing a, what was it, brain pan the other day and I needed to, or what, not brain pan, I think I was doing gatekeeper and I needed to get a binary or an executable off of an FTP server and I can't have it being transferred over ASCII. So I switched to binary and I guess I forgot to switch back. So I'm just going to delete these things because they are uh, corrupted and I'm going to FTP back in. And I'm going to get important.jpg and get, no. wait, am I still ASCII? Whatever, uh, the image doesn't matter, so I don't care if I download it in binary, but I do want to cat the notice. So cat notice.txt or get notice.txt, take a look at that. So of course you want to read stuff like this. Um, it says here, whoever's leaving these damn Among Us memes in the share, it is not funny. People downloading documents from our website will think we are a joke. Now, I don't know who it is, but mine is looking pretty sus. So we get two pieces of information. One, we know there's a user named Maya, which there isn't in this case, but usually there would be if someone's name is mentioned here. Uh, especially if they're referencing them to doing something like this, we know that this person would have access to the machine. Uh, here doesn't mean anything here, it's just a loophole. There's nothing really important with Maya. However, we can see that people downloading documents from our website, uh, we will see that there is an ability to download documents from a website that can be uploaded via a share. So usually this sort of thing is a vulnerability with uh, FTP and, or the FTP root directory is sharing the web root directory, which means if you upload a file to FTP, you can access it via uh, the web and that's dangerous because depending on uh, what uh, web service you're running it could execute code so apache obviously apache if we have php running on the back end it will execute php code if it's microsoft maybe we have you know we can execute aspx uh, here we know that it's apache and i'm just going to assume that php is running in the back end uh, you could probably confirm this with uh, a an extension like wapalizer like right here. Uh, anyway, we got all the information we need from FTP. Uh, there is more stuff we'll encounter, obviously. I just mentioned uh, that there's a vulnerability if they share the same uh, directory. So you may be thinking, well, they must share the same web root, but it's not exactly that simple. So we go here, uh, we can look at the source. There's nothing here, there's just, when are we gonna update this? Um, you can look at contact us, but you see in the bottom left, it doesn't do anything. So we're going to try go busting this and put that basic skill set to use. Uh, if you've never used go buster before, it's, uh, it is basically a tool that will uh, brute force directories given a word list. So we'll find hidden directories uh, based on the response code. If everything's returning a 200 like if there's a custom response code where 404s are like it's a custom 404 page so the web server returns 200. Uh, you could use something like fuff or i think it was wfuzz and you could uh, do the same type of uh, directory brute forcing but instead of looking at the response code you can look at the uh, size of the the response okay so we see here we have files so that's good Again, I mentioned before, I mentioned a third time about the vulnerability where FTP and web roots are in the same directory. Uh, we can verify this by trying to access something in FTP via the web server. And we see 404 not found, so that might not be the case. However, we did get files. And we see here important.jpg. 
So we know that um, it's FTP isn't sharing a web root directory uh, with the web server. It's sharing a subdirectory of the web root directory with the web server. So it's just it's the same thing. Literally, nothing's changed. We can still get remote code execution uh, via uploading a shell to the FTP server. So let's just do that. So I'm going to go to the bottom here, and I already have a shell in this directory because I prepped, and I think it has the right IP address config. Yep. So this is just a pen test monkey reverse shell. I use this one because it's the most stable PHP shell I know. And I'm just going to start a listener on Netcat. If you are unfamiliar with Netcat, uh, be sure to check out some of the networking try hack me rooms. Uh, Netcat is the networking Swiss Army knife, and it is able to receive and make TCP connections. We're going to be using that here because this shell, once it is triggered, once the code is executed, it's going to make a TCP connection back to us and it's gonna execute bash, so we're gonna get a shell on this uh, machine here. So PHP, uh, if you're unfamiliar with that language, it is a server side language, it executes on the server's end. So we can't see the source code if we do control U because the server executes it and it does not appear in our browser, which means if we put PHP code on the server and then we load it in our browser, the server will execute it before sending it to us. So that's why we wanna upload a shell because it will execute our malicious stuff. So I'm just going to go put shell.php. What's this? We get a 553, could not create file. Uh, we see here in the file permissions from doing dash la that there's another, another directory in here called FTP and we do have a full access to it. So let's go into there and then let's try putting shell.php. And it worked, good stuff. So now I'm going to try and trigger this. So we know it's an FTP and let's go to shell and we see here that it's loading. That's a good thing. That means we've popped a shell. We go back here, we look at our listener and we got stuff back. So this is good stuff right here. Uh, first thing we want to do is we want to stabilize the shell. There is a step of things to do to stabilize a shell. You can uh, turn off raw echo on your, your your systems uh, shell so it doesn't so you can use stuff like clear and then you can you know export the x term so you can use uh, up arrows i don't know if i got that backwards or not but it's whatever uh really i'm not going to do any of that because i don't really need that i'm fine living without it uh, there are also stuff that does this for you like uh, i think it's rl wrap i'm not going to go into too much detail about it because this is a beginner machine all we want to do is we want to turn this SH shell into a bash shell. We want to get a TTY. So um, to get a TTY shell, we can use Python. So let's check if there's Python on the system. Uh, there is. So let's do Python dash C import PTY and then PTY dot spawn a bin bash. And we see here we get a nice friendly bash shell. So let's ls and let's see where we are. So we are at the top of the directory tree and we could see that just by looking at this and we see we already have the first thing on our list. We got this spice recipe, it's right here. I'm not going to cat it out because you guys should try this for yourself, but we see there's some ASCII in there. So that's good stuff. Uh, we also see something else that's very unusual in here. If you've ever looked at a Linux file system, I'm just going to look at mine. We see incidents, which is not in here by default. It is very weird and it seems very strange. We can look at who created this. And wwdata, notice it's not owned by roots. It's at the top of the directory tree and it's owned by wwdata, the lowest privileged user. So let's see what's in there. We have suspicious.pcapng. Ooh. Well then, that looks very good. It's a pcap file, which means it's a packet capture. So we are going to be doing some light forensics, and we'll see what this pcap is all about. It's obviously na it's named suspicious. So maybe there is a previous incident. Well, I mean, it's named incidents as well. So there's probably a previous incident where someone tried to do something bad on this machine and it was recorded on this PCAP. Maybe we can get some good juicy info of what the other bad guy did and maybe we can use that to our advantage. 
So I'm just gonna get this on my local machine. I'm just gonna try copying this to the FTP directory and I'll just download it from there. So pcap ng var dubdub data uh, HTML and then FTP. A permission denied, okay. I don't even remember how I configure this machine. Uh, no worries though, we can transfer this using netcat. So I believe it's, do I have netcat on here? Yeah, I do, right? Okay. So netcats, um, so I'm just gonna do netcat lvp444 and let me, yeah, I'm in the right directory. So uh, put that out to sus.pcap. So I'm gonna get my IP address, so grep inet, it right here. The cat right here, 4444, and let's put this bad boy in there. So suspicious. I'm just going to paste that. Oh, I forgot to start this. So now I got to run that command again. Okay. So we have sus.pcap right here and it's successfully transferred. There's stuff in it. So let's take a look at it using a popular uh, internet capture or internet packet analysis tool called Wireshark. So let's open it. And this may look overwhelming if you're not familiar with uh, networking. However, it's simple stuff. A lot of this stuff is just uh, TCP stuff and doesn't really matter. Those are just basic protocols used to initialize a ton of different uh, more advanced protocols such as HTTP. Now let's just filter by HTTP and see what happens. So to do that, I'm just going to search HTTP. And this looks cool. Let's follow this stream. So we can just see the web request right here. And we see someone also tried to trigger a shell. This is not us. This was already here before. It may look like us because I named my shell the same thing, uh, but it's not. And it's coming from a, we also know it's a different, it's probably on, it's on a different network based on the host name. It looks like it's on a home network. So we definitely know this wasn't us who did it. So someone else tried to do this. Um, a popular port that people use when they are triggering a shell is port quad four. So that's 444, let's try to find that. I, if I remember how to use my filters correctly, I think it's IP, no, it's tcp. port, yeah, equals 4444. Let's just follow one of these. And we see here, uh, they did get a shell on this system and they seemingly used a uh, netcat uh, this is good stuff because it's just TCP traffic, so it's not encrypted. There are multiple tools out there to encrypt your Netcat uh, sessions, and I recommend you check out the What the Shell Room. I believe it's only available to subscribers. But that's one of the many reasons you should subscribe to Try Hack Me if you haven't already. So we can go through, we see what they did. They tried to import uh, bin bash just like we did. They tried to go into Lenny's home directory. They saw that they don't have permission. I forgot to check that. But it's a good thing to always try to CD into the user's home directory. Could be some other stuff in there. Maybe the user flag, we can access it already. So we see CD Lenny, which is me. And we can't. So we see permission denied. They got the same thing as us. And then they tried sudo dash Ling to see their current permissions they can run as root. And then they tried inserting this password, which is weird because WW data is a service account and typically doesn't have anything on it. Um, so maybe they made a typo and maybe they were, they meant to switch user to Lenny or whatever. Uh, so let's just try using this. Can't get enough spice password to switch user into Lenny. And we're Lenny now. So that was pretty easy. A uh, very simple packet analysis uh, to brush up or at least get introduced to forensic stuff uh, with networking. So... We're Lenny now, so that means that we can CD into Lenny and we can get the user.txt. So we've owned user. That's another thing off the to-do list. Uh, now we just need to get full access. So we see as soon as we get in here, there's a lot of stuff. We got a documents directory and a scripts directory. I'm gonna save you time in that the documents directory, there's nothing in it except a lot of jokes. 
So if you want to read those, go ahead, get a good laugh. Uh, I probably should have made these owned by Lenny because now they look like it's part of the uh, Privesk, but trust me, it's not. So let's see Dean two scripts because that looks good. That looks juicy. And we see here, we see that there is two things in here owned by Root, which is automatically suspicious. And this should make us think, well, there must be s either if we are able to edit this SH script, either Root is probably going to execute it at one point because he owns it, or either there is a cron job running in the background executing the script periodically uh, because it is owned by Root, or not because it is owned by Root, but as Root. So we can try uh, writing to this and changing it, but we're going to see a problem here with the file permissions. Uh, only the owner, which is roots, can write to this, so there's no way to write to it directly. We can, however, read it. So let's try reading it. And we see it's a very simple bash script. Uh, it just echoes the list environment variable into the startup list.txt. And then it, it calls this thing, which is very weird. It calls another external bash script. So it's important here that when you're editing a script getting executed by cron jobs for remote code execution, it's important not to just focus solely on the scripts. Uh, scripts could be using uh, environment variables that you can edit. They could be using a variety of things you can edit. If it's Python, maybe you can Maybe it's some sort of library poisoning. Maybe you have write access to the library or the module that the Python script is using, although that rarely occurs in real life. But it's a CTF. God knows what there is. You don't just want to stay in this one script. You want to see what this script calls, what it, what it requires from uh, other files in the file system. So we see here that's calling print.sh. So let's see if we have permissions on that. And we do have permissions because we own it. So that means we can change uh, et cetera print.sh and we can put a payload in there that will give us uh, something good, right? So in this case, uh, you could put whatever you want in there. You could put a reverse shell if you want um, using dev slash TCP or whatever. Uh, I'm just gonna, I don't want a reverse shell. I just want the root flag. So I'm gonna copy uh, all the contents in the roots directory to my local directory and then make me owner of it because that's really all I need to do. Uh, we can see what's in here already, but it's not anything important. It's just, it just says done to the screen. So I mean, why didn't they put that in there? But it's a CTF. So I'm just going to echo a small payload in there that will copy all the files from the root directory and put them in my home directory so that I can read them. So that's very simple to do. We'll just do copy root all to home Lenny and then let's just do chmod 777 home Lenny all. Let's see if this works. I haven't actually tried it. Uh, it should work. Um, and let's put this in etc. print.sh and make sure you use two of these so you're appending it and you're not overwriting it. So copy everything in root. Uh, the, this uh, asterisk is a wildcard in Linux or in Unix if you didn't know already. And hold on, I'm gonna do that instead. I don't even know if that would have changed anything, but uh, I'm just gonna be safe. And if we do that, we cat the file now. Okay, so we see it's gonna copy all the stuff in roots to our home directory and then uh, give full permissions on everything in our home directory. So assuming that the root flag is in the root directory, which obviously I assume it would be as it is on most CTFs, and I actually know it is because I made this box that uh, we should have the root flag and that should be the last thing off our, off our to-do list and we should be done. So I'm gonna just CD into home Lenny, or I could just type CD, but whatever. Um, I'm gonna type ls-la. Uh, not here yet, so we can assume that root hasn't executed yet or uh, the cron job hasn't executed it yet. So I'm just gonna wait about a minute uh, because I did this is running a cron job that executes the script as root and it executes uh, periodically every minute. So I'm just going to give it a second. Okay, we see here that it worked. We have the root flag and it's got stuff in it and we can file it and we'll see it's ASCII in there. So good job. Uh, we pwned startup. We did the startup. We did everything. And then we can go to the last thing and I can flex on or I can do a shameless plug with uh, all my, my credits. 
So thank you guys so much for watching. I know this was a very relatively easy box. I'm gonna be doing some uh, other boxes on try hack me and hack the box in here as well. It's just other stuff I encounter in my security life. Um, again, thank you for watching. I am working on a, a more medium difficulty type of box that I obviously wanna implement the same type of thing here, like untraditional stuff via traditional means. It's going to be called Hackers. It's based on the movie Hackers 1995. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. It's going to have some cool stuff in there like PDF cracking. And it's going to be another custom script except, you know, it's going to be much deeper than this. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Of course, I'm going to be doing blind stuff as well. So obviously for this case, I knew uh, how to beat startup because I made startup. But I'm going to be doing lots of boxes on Hack the Box and Try Hack Me that I go in completely blind. A black black box it and just see what happens so thank you guys for watching i hope this write-up helped you and educated you and if you're just starting out in the cyber security field welcome this is a very new fresh plot of life and you're going to enjoy it a lot you have no idea how obsessed you are going to become with just breaking shit so thank you guys for watching i'll see you guys pretty soon peace